John Harrington. I'm 30 years old. The fact is, I am completely mad. No fact that I am a madman. Someone is tiptoeing inside my brain. Ooh. Why do I hear those footsteps? John, I'm going to find her and don't say the rest or else you could get banned from Facebook. Uh, welcome back to the second segment on the German <clears throat> Asylum double feature. And I hope all of you are still feeling the shock from that ending of Straight Jacket. Those of you who didn't know it was coming anyway. Yeah. And now I could say it. Um, I, I, I love the pre Scooby-Doo ending. I say that because this is a Scooby Doo ending before that show ever existed. Literally, there's a character in a mask. Yeah. Which is, I mean, and that's the thing, too. It's like, I don't know why that in a movie of this era, of this age, I'm totally acceptable of it. But it's like Scooby Doo ruined that for movies afterwards. Now it's like, I can't watch a newer movie with, you know, you're not getting away with that these days. I really like the uh, scene of George Kennedy's head getting chopped off because it's it's actually really shocking yeah. uh, with the cut to the pigs right after and the pigs hanging up. It's it's pretty intense for any era. Uh, it's wild. It reminded me a lot of the decapitation in Twitch of the Death Nerve. Yeah, I don't. I I want to know how in the hell are there these axes out there that can take a person's head clean off with one swing? Okay. Magical axe. Yeah. <laughs> It has to be a really, really sharp axe. Yeah, Becca said they're called Hollywood axes. <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty amazing. Um, and Carol was sure a crafty little killer, wasn't she? she her sh upper body strength is amazing. Yes. She's, like, she's a very tiny girl, and she can just lop your head clean up and get away with it and set her mom up. Like, she's wild. She thought of everything. Like, when she lures George Kennedy into the barn... Oh. She even managed to close the door and, and like to like slam the door and then know exactly when he was leaning over that that yep. cooler to sneak up on him with the axe. And she's very committed to that part. She keeps wearing those bangle G 
jangle bracelets. <laughs> and you, you would think if you want to sneak up on somebody, that would be the last thing you'd add to your wardrobe. But she she wanted it to be authentic. And she's able to see in that mask. That's like an old Ben yeah. Cooper mask. That isn't like latex. Like that's a heavy, hard to breathe in nose holes that cut your nose mask. She's like, I don't care. She, she does it. She was committed. Hundred percent. She that's got that mask because she she's, she's able to do like at least minimal emoting in it. Yeah. That and was I also weird. Like, she, found, she found someone out there. She's like, here's a picture of my mom. I want you to make a mask of her head. <laughs> well, well I think she, she made it. Oh, yeah. She's yeah a she made it, but still. Still. Yeah, it's like it looks really the scene where they're fighting, it's like, wow, this is she did really good. You know, I made this sculpt of your head. That's not weird. The mask I made of your face, though, that's what's weird. <laughs> that's yeah. pretty weird. Yeah. I don't know. Um and plus she had to uh get the hair just right, too. The hair oh. was very important in this yeah. movie. There was uh, never underestimate the value of a wig. How much did you buy under a wig? Mm. She spent hours getting the eyebrows just right, like hooking and you know what I mean, like just sewing the eyebrows in. Yeah, perfection. They were sewn in. I, that's been genius. I probably that's how they used to do those masks, or maybe she they look better than painted on. If you try and sew Joan's eyebrows in. You're up for a really uh, difficult task. Hi, Vivi. Hey, Vivi. She had to come say hi to everybody. <laughs> she looks so cute. Usually she's very um, camera shy. Hi, so, uh, <laughs> Cubby. I, I think Becca's trying to get you two together. I have no animals. Our babies would be beautiful. <laughs> look how shy she is. She won't even look. <laughs> And he normally looks away. He's enchanted with her. She's like, oh, I, I look a mess. <laughs> He's like, you look good to me. Um, so, yeah, that, that was a pretty interesting uh, te technique that Carol had with that axe. And um, George Kennedy, was there a time when people just painted their cars with a, with a paintbrush? I've seen people driving around with a paintbrush car. It's a there's a Jerky Boys reference, too, where uh, the painter job, where he's like, I got a car painted up nice, used a brush and everything. <laughs> so I always think about that, used a roller and a brush. But I've seen people do that with, like, just painting them black and, you know, if they're beater cars. Yeah, but maybe. <laughs> that was George Kennedy ahead of his time. I, What's I, amazing I, Go ahead. I swear to God, there was a guy in our neighborhood that had a station wagon and it was carpeted on the outside. Oh, was, was it like the rug bug? Have you ever seen the rug bug on 51? Yes, I have. Yeah. yeah. It's Both a Volkswagen carpet. bug that is upholstered, in case you don't live in Pittsburgh. <laughs> nice. Well, there's George also a guy that drives around with all kinds of stuff <laughs> uh, written in masking tape on his car. And I think at one time it said, like, Fleetwood Mac. Oh really? <laughs> I don't know, but it's all this like um, you know websites leading to conspiracy theories, and I, I saw a guy's that. truck today that was hand painted and it said on the back one of the people, and I was like, "What's that even mean?" Like, yes, of course. Stand <laughs> strong. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. There was another one that uh, had like you know how you get those individual letters, the old style stick on letters. Someone had an entire thing, a conspiracy thing, written all over their car um, at Starbucks. Of course, I filmed it for like a good half an hour while we were on. <laughs> their conspiracy did not extend to spending $7 for a coffee. So. George Kennedy yeah. looked incredibly young in this. And it you know was... what's funny is he had just broke into acting here because do you know what he did before that, Bill? Uh -uh. He was a soldier. He grew up in a showbiz family, but he uh -huh. uh, was in – he served in the armed forces uh, in the Navy, I believe. And then after that, he was a consultant on the Phil Silver show and Phil Silver's helped him break into acting. Uh, and he appeared on a few episodes of that just as one of the crew members, which I always thought was kind of cool. So he kind of got into his career that way. I saw this comment here. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. That sounds like something out of the movie super van, <laughs> which I love because the majority of that movie is just going to a van show. And looking at vans for like padded out half an hour of, of just van. 
<laughs> and, and it's all about a solar powered van that everybody wants to get because it's 1970s, right? Who didn't want one? So I look this up. Yeah, look um, up. he looked like he was in his 30s to I me. See. But yeah, maybe dressed up to look a little older than he really was. I don't know. So this was made in '64. Let's do some yeah. math. I'm looking up George Kennedy right now. Um, he, he was uh, 39 during this. Okay, oh, good guess. Yeah. How about that? And you know what's funny is like this is a not a huge role, but you know three years later he's nominated for an Oscar for Cool Hand Luke, which is other than maybe a Airplane and being a Naked Gun probably his best known movie. Well, you know, <clears throat> if if Joan liked him I, and William Castle liked him, I'm sure that didn't hurt. I bet Joan demanded that he come to her trailer and service her. <laughs> She's like, "You're going to pour this whole Pepsi for me." And you're going to do it <laughs> in a glass bottle, and you're going to take your time with it. Somebody said Michael was pretty hot. Someone in the chat mentioned that. And, yeah, Michael's hair was just amazing in this film. Um, can we talk about Michael's hair for a little yes, while? Yes, please. <laughs> it kind of had a sheen to it and uh i guess i said like you know maybe he this was the time when guys were still trying to look like elvis mm -hmm. it was all slicked back and motionless he had the da as they used to call it the duck's ass <laughs> my favorite name for a haircut my grandfather used to do that he would use the vo5 in his hair and if you touched his hair which he wouldn't allow you it was like just straight shellac in, in the waviness of it it had its own shell. Yeah, exactly. You have to chisel it off if you actually want to comb it. I, my favorite part of this movie is when they're going to go to that party and Joan has to flip out before it. And everybody still goes to the party afterwards after she's made that gigantic scene. It's like every, nobody's like, maybe we should just let her be for a bit. She's a little brittle. They're like, nah, let's just go to that party. It seems like it'll be a good idea. Did we? Wait, are you talking about when... Um... Carol made her go to the dinner party. Yeah. Yeah. She literally just had a nervous, like a mini nervous breakdown. She still goes to the party. Well, that was important to Carol's plan though. She had yeah, to get yes. her upset and then make her go there. So she'd have a big breakdown in front of the, the stiffs. Well, the yeah. husband was kind of cool, but the, the wife was like a harridan. She yeah. was just absolutely terrifying. A school teacher gone amok. <laughs> Did we, that uh, sounds like a, uh, a translated uh, Gialli title. School teacher gone amok, exclamation point. What would you say, Dustin? I was going to say, did we mention that that was a uh, an added on ending? No, you should you should talk about that. I don't I don't really know too, too much about it. I just know that. <laughs> oh, you're stuck with it now. You brought it up. Oh, thanks a lot. <laughs> um, that the ending that was uh, on the film here was like, a, I guess, like a... a, a late add-on by Joan herself uh, because she wanted it very much to be herself the last thing that the audience sees you know if she's the star she should end the movie as well I think it was originally ending with the daughter freaking out after being caught um, but you know this was Joan's movie so she got what she wanted yeah she had the script totally rewritten before the yeah. movie even started sure yeah. I, well, I don't know how much of it was, but I know at least certain parts where, you know, either she wanted to be more of a focus in a scene or, or she wanted to have certain lines of dialogue change I knew about. The, originally, yeah. the killer was supposed to be disguised inside of a fat suit. Yes. And that got changed, too, obviously, to the bangles and beads. Yeah. Joe wasn't going to have a fat suit. You know, uh, the other weird thing is that sculpture of her, it was from another Joan Crawford movie. It's from uh, A Woman's Face from 1941. And I imagine that Joan had it and said, well, here, you can use this. Let's just use this thing that I have sitting in my house. I have a lot of sculptures of myself. The other thing I forgot to mention, you know how Lee Majors got this part, Bill? No, do tell. Rock Hudson recommended him. Yep. Oh. <laughs> well, now well, we know. Say no more, right? 
Mm -hmm. uh, I think was it uh, I read too that Joan was part of the reason that he changed his name because she couldn't pronounce it. So, <laughs> wow, his name's Harvey. Harvey, you know that name just won't do. <laughs> it's got to be something easy to remember. The other thing Joan now come to my movie. trailer. <laughs> come to my trailer and pour a Pepsi very slowly. <laughs> That's how he became the six million dollar man. Joan also wanted to get knitting into the movie, which was her hobby. So that's why she knits. And <laughs> I love these notes that she would give. She's like, you know, can, I think this movie would be better if there was a scene where I knitted. That Aren't explains you? why that felt very thrown in. Yeah, it's like, yeah, that's why. She, uh, her knitting was featured in many women's magazines of the day. So, yeah, she was a red book queen, as, as Becca just said. Barbara Bennett is here from New York doing a cover story on me for Red Book. <laughs> I well, love the, the, that that lady's getting ready to do an interview, and she's like, "I'm gonna choke the fuck out of my daughter. I don't care who's who's here." <laughs> I am not one of your fans. That was what did it. Yep. <clears throat> this was this had an ungrateful daughter in it, definitely. Although she did have a legitimate beef with her mother. I mean, like, you know, when your mom chops off somebody's head right in front of you, that yeah. that counts as a bit as a big mistake. Yeah. Yeah, I'm checking out the uh the ending thing that that is uh the ending was kind of like based on psycho, kind of like where the character explains everything after psycho. Cuz <laughs> yeah, originally the ending was Joan just holding up the daughter's the mask of her on face screaming, she's insane, which I completely would love. If that would I guess it's not plagiarism if you have Robert Block write yeah. your movie. Yeah. If you can... oh, well, the only person I ever know that got sued for ripping off himself was John Fogarty because uh, Credence sued him for his first solo album. They said, this sounds like Credence. And he goes, yeah, I wrote all those songs, of course. It sounds um, a lot like Credence Clearwater. Yeah, there's one specific song that I can't think of it right now. I have the zombie. Or uh, night, which one is uh, not a zombie, but it's like from his first album, yeah, like the, the '80s one, yeah. That Fogarty song, "Revenge of the Dead," yeah, I've heard it. Yeah. <laughs> Virus, that Fogarty song from 1980 that he did with uh, Bruno Batai. Hell of the Living Dead. Hell, hell of the Hell of the Living Rumble in the Jungle. <laughs> the old man down the road by the house by the cemetery. <laughs> oh well, that one's great too. Only. Uh, as good as fortunate son of a Manhattan baby. And yeah, so it was old man, old man down the road. Is that the yeah. song? You got to hide, hide, hide. That's another DV song, Bill. That's a yeah. Uh, if you turn it on right now, I bet that song's on. They used to show that on night tracks all the time oh, they on sure TBS. Did. The video. It has like, the uh, guitar chord. You follow yeah. it the whole way through the swamp. Yep. It's a concept piece, man. You know. <laughs> We've got this American fellow we're doing a video for. Um, but uh, I wonder how everybody in the chat feels about this movie. I, it seems like people really dug it. Yeah. yeah. That's what I was seeing. And, you know, I really, like, I was thinking about it as I watch it, like, uh, for all the people not thinking much of Castle as a director, there's some really nice framing, um, some really – it looks really nice. Like it, it's a good looking movie. The Devil's Rain will only be stopped after like twelve minutes of, of faces melting and bodies melting for a long time. Oh my god, that scene where she flirts with Michael is just gold. Yeah. And yeah, <laughs> touching his mouth was really the limit. I, I just love any any Joe movie where she is like everybody's like has to act like as if she is 30 years younger than she is. And they should. Fuck them, right? She's a star. Well, Nobody in this movie is anywhere near her, her star wattage. So. You're right, Dustin. She is a star. I, this one, she's more than the star. This is, you know, if you want to call something a vanity project to a degree, that's what this is. We're going to do this. Yeah, stuff. she... You're right. I mean, she shaped the script even. So, uh, you know, th that is, it, it's sort of a vanity project. And she, and she brought in that guy to play a role in the movie too. Mm -hmm. 
she How changed the plot of the trick yet? Yet? That's the a great question. <laughs> Which one didn't she like? Uh, Leslie Parrish, like I said, bailed out oh. because of the mask. And then Anne Helm, I don't know what the reasoning is, but Joan's the one who had her replaced. Yeah. So, you know, if she just basically says, no, you're out, we're going to get this other actress because she's played my daughter before. Yeah, in Delta, yeah. Yep. This is top tier William Castle, Matthew Beam. And I love it. Um, I think another great William Castle is um, uh, the one that came after this. I saw what you did. Yeah. I really dig that one. And this it's one, I, this is another thing. Oh, yeah, the prank calls. Wait, what's that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the prank phone call movie. Oh, yeah, call. yeah, 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 yeah. This was a very artful film. There were there were a couple shots that I wanted to mention uh, in the in the segment, which one of them was where there was a scene set inside the cab of a truck, and you saw um, the aunt's face in the in the mirror, and then out the window behind her was the uncle, and they were having a conversation. I thought that was a really clever shot, and also when George Kennedy goes into the barn and gets his head cut off. Yeah. Uh, it gets dark, but he's still very well lit inside this blackness. I thought that was really great. I like the scene where right before they go to that, to the party, you know, where she has the breakdown, when she walks through the people, like the window is like, so the shadow of the, almost like a cross from the window beam is like across her. Like, and it's really cool how she walks across it. It's, it's really nice. It's it's a good looking movie. Like uh, I'm shocked that nobody's tried to remake this. I know they remade a lot. Oh, don't say that. <laughs> yeah, I know. I don't want to put that in the universe. Too late. Yeah. Yeah, homicidal. Um, I like homicidal, but it. I did. I saw it right away. Like as yeah. soon as they brought out the brother, I was like, oh, I. That's so and so. So uh, in case someone hasn't seen that 40, 50 year old movie. Uh, <laughs> There, I, I got the twist right away, and I was like, oh, and then for the rest of the movie, I'm like, oh, have they figured it out yet? Yeah, yeah. Preserve so, should do. Yeah, oh, it's so careful with the older movies too. You know, which one? At what point can I talk about this? Yeah, you never know because someone's someone's always going to be mad. Well, there are a few people tonight who said this was their first time seeing this movie. So, yeah. All right, sorry, Sam. Go ahead. No, no, no. I'm good. The, the I'm just actually, excited that we watched this and uh, everybody enjoyed it. This is a, a enjoy, this is a great movie. So, well, it's not like I'll, I, I was saying to my wife earlier. It's not my favorite William Castle movie, but you know, at the same time, you know, my favorite ones are probably the more common ones that you can see a lot of other places. This one I don't see on TV broadcast too much. Uh, maybe I'm wrong there. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, at least we got to show one of his movies, and it's not one of the most common ones. And, you know, we showed some Joan, so that made a few people happy as well, too. And it seems like most people enjoyed it, so I'm pretty happy about that. Bill, my favorite William Castle moment is when they showed the Tingler to drive in, and everybody started honking the horns when the Tingler got loose. Oh, yeah. Good people stuff. People were flashing their lights and, and honking. <laughs> That's awesome. awesome. <laughs> yeah. I was super excited for that moment. You have to improvise, you know, when yeah. you're at the drive-in. Yeah. That Tangler is creepy looking. <laughs> it scared the shit out of me when I was a kid. Yeah. Can you imagine if you were a kid, if you are like 10 and you went to the theater and your seat started buzzing? You probably would lose your fucking mind. Dustin, didn't you write about the Tangler in the magazine? Oh, God. Did I? I think I did. Um... It's, it's possible. I've been writing for you for a long time now. I don't remember everything I've read. <laughs> You've been on ever since the almost from the very beginning. I think you were in issue number three. Uh, no, I don't think it was that early. I could look. I want to say it was like five or six. A little bit after. That's still a long, long time ago. What's what's? <clears throat> I was about to say what's the new one, but yes. I, I had one sitting here, You're but then I moved it when the dog so. came over. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, I, don't know, I have to put my crawler up. <laughs> yes, do that, please. Show it again, Dustin. Here is the new issue. 
uh, I think a lot of people in the chat seem to have it, at least the people who I, I talk to. Uh, I don't want to give away too much because, you know, you should totally go and buy it first. Uh, but, you know, we have the interview with, with Pat Hardy from Har High on the cover here. Uh, what else am I missing? Because I, to be honest with you, I'm not even ready yet. I just came, like, earlier this week. I had a chance to read it. Christine DeBell. Yep, Christine DeBell's on here. Uh, Sam, which one is yours? Nightmare Theater, uh, the syndicated package. I know, just like, like talking about the movie Marta. I know Gigi's in here. I saw her in the chat. Yeah, she wrote about that David Durston film, Stigma, about VD. <laughs> I didn't know that she liked David Durston, so that was a surprise. I know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the beautiful ads. It's a well-kept secret. Uh, uh, I can't get enough Hallmark. This, this, this. Stigma, uh, uh. yeah. There were, there were a lot of ads for that. I thought that was sort of a um, more obscure release, but it isn't. It, a lot of cities got Stigma. Actually, hey, that is there. Uh, looks like there's a few, a few comments about the new issue. So looks like a few people's already picked it up. That's, that's Steve awesome. like the interview with Christine by Bill Green, and uh, yeah, there's a lot of good stuff in it. I, I'm I'm always so glad that everybody brings something special to the issue, no matter what it is whether it's an interview or just a memory of something that I love when people share memories about watching the movies and where they mm -hmm. saw them. Roger wrote a great piece like that. Roger Braden about seeing uh, beyond the door Two at the drive-in with Friday the 13th mm -hmm. part two. It's, uh, that's a good one. And AC Nicholas in the new issue wrote about going into grind houses and how scary it was and like the weird shit he saw in there. So that's my favorite stuff. <sighs> So yeah, go pick it up. The new issue of Drive in Asylum. Um, our I second film, it's the dude just because I had recently seen it and thought it was awesome. <laughs> I'm glad you thought so. Um, hey, well, it seems like a lot of people felt the same when they watched it here. So, I mean, if we help spread knowledge of that film, I think that we've done our damn pretty awesome job there. Oh. Uh, Daryl, I know there's so many fabulous things in the Mahoning. It pisses me off that it's so far to drive. Um, I do get there maybe once a year for, for one thing, but um, I don't know. I have to have somebody invite me over to their house to spend the night. <laughs> Any takers? Um, anything else we want to say about Straight Jacket before we move on to our second feature of the evening, which is a doozy? <laughs> uh, that's a, I don't, that, that I don't think we haven't said. Um, like I said, I'm glad people joined it. I'm always happy to get people to watch some black and white films on here too. Um, yeah. Not, also, too, it, it's really not too far out of the realm of some of the horror films that you guys are already showing on here. Uh, We've seen a lot of, as I call them, the women slowly going mad films. <laughs> so it, it totally fits there. Um, and like I said, I know there, I you know, I saw there was definitely a few requests for William Castle in the in the comments in previous weeks. So if we could get a black and white film and a William Castle film on one shot and get some Joan in there at the same time too, hell yeah. Sam is a real Castle fan, too, I know. Yeah. I'm well, super just, excited we got to Just the man himself is fascinating. So if, if just to even talk about him, because I know there's a couple things said here that I'm not really sure I do. Uh, yeah, just to talk about him in general, it seems that that's pretty fun, too. And like I said, hopefully we can get a couple people who may not be too well-versed in him to go look at more of his films. Yeah, I would definitely recommend anybody to buy his uh, autobiography because it it's a great ride. Um, it's it's a laugh out loud book. I, or John Waters talked about it in his book Role Models. That's how I discovered it. Where he said, you know, that that was really his 
you know, his idea of someone that made movies and uh, made movies exciting. So that's it was it was great in the feud TV show that John Waters got to play William Castle. Yeah. Uh, yeah, probably, made me super happy. That has to be a high point in his life. Good night, Roger. Roger, leaving so soon. We haven't even started talking about our second feature tonight, Hatchet for the Honeymoon. Yeah. yeah. Which I'm super excited about because have I ever mentioned that I like Mario Baba? <laughs> you may have heard that a few times from you, Sam. Yeah. Um, I love this movie uh, because it the main character is the antagonist and not the protagonist, which is uh -huh. kind of wild when you think about it. And I kind of like his uh, opening narration, Bill. It would be fun to do a uh, cross between his open his narration in the trailer with uh, Messiah of Evil where they're kind of like talking to each other. And she's like, you'll never stop screaming <laughs> as, as it goes back and forth. But um, I love this movie, and, and I just think it's uh, it's got so many cool moments in it, especially my favorite thing in it is it has a meta moment before movies did that where uh, when the cops come at some point in the movie, not to spoil too much, but – uh, John, the main character, is watching Black Sunday on TV, and he tells the cops, oh, I'm just watching a horror movie. And it's a Mario Baba movie that he's watching, but then a Mario Baba movie, which is wild, right? Like, today we just be like, oh, yeah, that's how, you know, everything is interconnected and meta. Right. But not in 1970, right? So I really think that that's pretty cool. Um, also, uh, I love uh, Dagmar Lassender. I just watched The Laughing Woman, uh, another movie she's in that, I definitely recommend that Mondo Macabre just put out. That's the movie that she did before this. That movie is insane. It's really great. Uh, and she's really great in this. She's also in Forbidden Photos of the Lady Above Suspicion and, of course, House by the Cemetery and a ton of other stuff. Um, but she's really good in this. And uh, I love how uh, John's character is just kind of – it's the total Italian movie character where he's uh, <laughs> he's kind of like hamstrung in life and he's going to just – keep killing women to get past it. And, uh, and yet you're supposed to somehow empathize with him a little bit um, if you can. And uh, also I, I think a reason, if I may posit why Bill likes this, a mannequin movie. That's no small part of why I adore this movie. Or why so, else do you enjoy it? The other reason was because I first saw it on Chiller Theater when I was a kid. Oh, yeah. So that's burned into my psyche. Yeah, I'm, I'm amazed that this played Chiller Theater. I can't even comprehend this playing on regular – I mean, not that it's that violent, but it's a very strange movie. So I just – it feels like something that should be beamed into your home at like 1.10 a.m., right? Dustin, have you seen this movie? Yeah, I've seen it. Uh, I don't have – I haven't watched it in a few years, uh, and I know – I. I think I was kind of wasted a couple times when I watched it. Um, <laughs> so I don't remember plot points too much. I mean, I remember the general story. Uh, but I, I just remember being, you know, pretty visually impressed with it. And I, like I said, it, it definitely did not bore me. Um, you know, I, this is going to be a refresher course for me watching it again tonight. Um but like I said, yeah, I was just visually impressed with it enough that, you know, it stayed with me, and I, I'm kind of a sucker for mannequins, too. Really? Um, you, too? Oh, yeah. They're creepy. Well, you're from you're from Tampa. That's why you love mannequins. Robert J. Emery's from Tampa, too, and he made that mannequin. Yeah, she's movie. also in The Black Cat. They're just, That's another movie they're just creepy. There's something about Tampa and mannequins. I haven't quite figured <laughs> it out yet. Well, we have a few other weird things going on around here. Um, I mean, I know we have the, the Cloud City not too far away. Don't be shy, Vivi. Um, so, yeah, this, this really was one of those late night movies for me. And those are always very special, like the stuff that... And, you know, I was a kid, so... And this movie doesn't have a monster in it or anything, so... This was sort of like the cutting edge. Bava did a lot of that for me. Like Lisa and the Devil. That was another one that I saw on late night TV. And it didn't have anything really all that scary in it. But even as a kid, I picked up on this movie's really weird vibe. 
and I love it for that reason. I think that Baron Blood too, like they all set up this yeah. like world. Um, that at least had a monster. Yeah, but it's interesting <laughs> on the new Blu-ray for Shock. Uh, one of the things in the the commentary is that Shock is his only r truly like modern film. Yeah. All the other films like feel like they have this war between the the age of old and like modern. Do you know what I mean? Kind of, and I know this one's a little more modern, but yeah. everything feels like trapped in like a an indeterminate age within this this movie. I know there's TVs and stuff, but it just feels like he's so good at just creating this eerie vibe where anything can happen. And this this feels like yeah, there's a lot of murder mystery and stuff in it, but there's a, no small amount of supernatural moments that happen in this as well. And uh, I love that. It feels like that's why I love Italian movies. Like whereas American movies are so they're very regimented on some level and like, everything has very, to make sense. Yeah. And there's studio notes and stuff where Baba movies are just like, Hey, just for anything can happen. <laughs> and then once you get past Baba to other filmmakers, they're just, they have even less care about, you know, Fulci is like the, the it, beyond it version of Baba where it's like anything can happen and it's not going to make a lot of sense, but you just right. like, at some point you throw your hands up and you're like, okay, now we're inside a painting. Cool. Um, well, <laughs> Going back to what you were saying about Baba and, and the mix of new and old, uh, even uh, going one of his that I really enjoy, Planet of the Vampires, mm -hmm. has a definite feel of that going on. You still have this futuristic sci-fi space movie going on, but even and part of it is the budget itself. There's this trappings of it that makes it feel old, that makes it feel grounded, that almost makes it feel like this futuristic gothic horror uh, that... And, to me, that just that's one of the things I just love about that movie. That and the really, uh, the costumes have a real old uh, sci-fi serial, like a, a Flash Gordon or, or what is it, Commander Cody feel to it. Yeah. Uh, very, very comic booky. Yeah, and they're also kind of gothic too, and with the yeah. high collars, and then also because he had no budget, it's just fill everything with fog, yep. and, and yeah. change the colors, make stuff look wild. His uh. Hercules in the Haunted World is my favorite Hercules movie because it's nuts. Like, it's like it, the colors are wild. Like, it's it's really good. And obviously, Danger Diabolics, one of the greatest movies ever made. And I can never say enough about it. That's what I love about Baba. It's real hard to pick my favorite one because there's so many good ones. And they're all so, like, wildly different yep. um, look and feel-wise. But then I also feel like they still work within it. But um, that's why even Rabbit Dogs is really good. Um kidnapped rabbit dogs even though he didn't really get a chance to finish it and it's very contained within one place versus his movies usually seem so big and uh i really dig that i like this uh, is really all the movies that we showed now we've shown a lot we showed shock and we showed uh baron, baron blood. blood yeah twitch of the death nerve didn't we do that did we, we do did, that we said, yeah we did it I yeah. think at least in the devil. Yeah, we have yeah, a thing for Mario. It's early. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. That that that's one of my go-to movies. Yeah, well, yeah. I would say that was like one of the first couple weeks. Yeah. Am I that obvious? <laughs> but uh, I'm super excited. I, I'd like to know who has seen this or not seen this, but. Uh, I feel like this might be a lesser known Mar Mario Bava film. Yeah. It doesn't get talked about a lot. At least I don't see it being talked about. And uh, I think it might even be pretty influential yeah. to other movies, especially um, there's sort of a, an American psycho thing going yeah, on cool. with the way the, like you said, the killer. We're not giving anything away by telling you that the main character is the killer. He tells you that from the very beginning. So uh, it, it, that, that's interesting. I don't remember very many movies that were like that. Yeah. It reminds me a bit, Mark is somewhat similar too, where it's, and so is um, uh, Beyond Darkness is kind of like it too, where it's these kind of insane rich men that are obsessed with a certain woman and can never get past it and have to kill, but want to keep parts of them. You know what I mean? It's like that. It's kind of a, a story idea that I keep coming right. back to. Is it that a giallo? Is, is it a giallo? Uh, 
I don't know. No. Hatch it? Hatch it. I don't think so because I always base it on is there somebody that's a stranger from a strange land like trying to investigate a murder that they can't solve and uh, but there is fashion there is murder there's enough there's a lot of elements but I think of it more as horror I'm gonna say no just because there's no mystery to it yeah yeah that's that's my bit my biggest problem with that yeah. it, it's like you said they they don't try to hide who the you know killer is Paul, Paul, Paul brings up blood and black lace too that's the hard part about bob is like there's so many good ones you forget i think blood and black lace is probably my number two <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah i mean that's a good one right if, if that shows up yeah there is an uh, there is a mystery element to it yeah it's not the the, the identity of the killer though there, there's yeah, another yeah. mystery in the movie well what's it's funny like, is if you there's certain other movies like lizard and the woman's skin that i'm like yeah, it doesn't really work in those rules, but it is. One of my it's new faves. It, it is such a weird, gaseous cloud of what is and is not. It's kind of up to you. I'm so glad that you love that movie, by the way, Bill, though. When that bad attack happened, you were so happy. Like That's one of my favorite drive-in moments, sitting next to you, and you're like, oh, well, this is wonderful. You knew I was going to love that movie, too. Oh, you I were did, like, yeah. I really think you're going to like this. Yeah. And when and it's just start going, you're like, I don't really know what's happening, and I don't know what's going on, but I love it. And uh, that's why that movie's great. I wasn't convinced anybody knew what was going on during that movie, but apparently it was just me. Um, let's look at some no, it's, ads it's, for Hatchet for a Honeymoon. Yeah, well, because well, uh, well, <laughs> Go get that cocktail ready too, Sam. Yeah. Okay, so um, this movie actually did play a lot of theater dates in the States in early 1972. El Paso was the earliest. Oh, I wow. Um, oh, I meant to say 72. I typed wrong. It is February 1972. I'm going to fire the production guy for this. <laughs> um, here it is with Night of Ooh, the Living Dead. That's an odd pairing. Yeah. In color. <laughs> oh, what? But don't believe everything you see in the paper, kids. Um, it was PG originally. And I think PG meant a little bit more of a strong rating back then, especially in those early days of yeah. the PG rating. Um, oh, I just love the graphics in this. It's just an amazing ad campaign. Um, is that a hatchet? I don't know. I think that's a cleaver. Is that, a <laughs> that was a cleaver. Cleaver um, for the wedding. Look at all that, all those dots. That really turns me on. Um, <laughs> with Bluebeard, he did away with beautiful women. So does the lead character in Hatchet for the Honeymoon. Yeah. So that's a great pairing right there. And that it, is played, great. it played a lot of dates with Bluebeard, including Pittsburgh. Uh, here, here it is at the Pittsburgh drive-ins. Uh, the Gateway in New Kensington was sort of my hometown drive-in, sort of. Uh, the other one was the Sunset View in Natrona Heights. But um, there's a lot of dates. Mount Lebanon Drive-In, Northside Drive-In. Uh, but at the South Hills Drive-In, Bluebeard was with the Honeymoon Killers. How about that? Oh. <laughs> Another Honeymoon movie, but <laughs> a different Honeymoon movie. Oh, look at this. Oh, I, love oh. Oh, I knew this was going to get you excited, Sam. Uh, wow, that is a night that... I'll get an in-car heater and just enjoy my whole night. Two <laughs> Bava films in a row. And look at this. Oh, Mantis, Mantis and Lace. Lace. Oh, man. Ooh, where's that time machine when you need it? Oh, and, the Oasis uh, driving is my destination. And can we talk about the stewardesses, too? Oh, look. Um, here it is in London. March of 73. Okay. And this was, uh, you know, towards the end of its U.S. theatrical run. It was in London as Blood Brides, a, wow. an alternate title. And you know, that gets me really excited. Um, so does Peter Cushing. Just see, I'm not into him. I just love his movies. Okay. Let me be very, very clear. Um, oh, my God. This played so many great double features. I know. This is incredible. Oh. And yeah, so here it is under the Blood Brides title in in the United States. This is from Hartford, Connecticut. 
from August 76. It was on TV right around this same time too. Yeah. So Hatchet for the Honeymoon was one of those movies. You could, you might catch it at the theater. You might see it on television. Sure. Um, I know that's the first place I saw it. Here it is on Chiller Theater, April 30th, 1977. Who's the asshole that gave this one star? Oh, I would like to give that person a sharp slap across the face for that. Look at that double feature. Chiller Theater, amazing. Yeah, I know. that's an odd pairing. Yeah, you never knew what you were going to get on there. And, you know, I guess there was a reason for that. They just showed whatever they had in their pack. Right. Wow. I'm just excited about seeing Mantis and Lace in this movie together. I can't even imagine. My brain would have exploded all over the planet. Like, what <laughs> is happening? It's a big idea to get used to, isn't it? It is. It is uh, it's going to get me through this next week and for two. <laughs> Sometimes like things like that, I'm, I just think, I am. we live in a reality where these things happen, so we should feel good about them, right? Anywho. Dustin, make- when was the first time you saw Hatchet for the Honeymoon? Oh, gosh. Uh, maybe about 10 to 12 years ago. Uh, also late night. Uh I don't know if we were coming in from somewhere or I was just up or something. Uh, it was, I want to say it was maybe Epics when they first started. Because uh, when, and my wife could hopefully chime in here, uh, Epic, Epics had a channel when they first started where they showed tons of Bava films and Corbin films and just like uh, older sci fi and horror films 24 7. It was. I, I look forward to the later night movies because that's generally when they were showing like a lot of the older films and a lot of the older Italian films that I hadn't seen before. I was seeing for the first time there. Um, it was a drive-in channel, wasn't it? Yes, I want to say so. Mm-hmm. And it was before I moved to Tampa, so yeah, I want to say like ten to twelve years. What about you, Sam? I had talked about it and I hadn't seen it and I bought the DVD and watched it that night and Becca and I watched it together. It was right when she first moved in. It's probably like seven or eight years ago and uh, we loved it. So we're excited to watch it together again tonight. It looks like you have a commemorative cocktail to share with us. I do. And I also want to say the, if you guys have Roku or you another way to watch Pluto, on one of the Pluto Horror Channels this month, The Keep is playing on there, which is nuts. Because the keep is not on DVD or Blu-ray or any other way of getting right. it, so that's kind of cool. So that is exciting. Yeah. So this is a tomahawk I'm going to make, which is kind of like a hatchet, right? <laughs> this is a tomahawk for the honeymoon is what it's called. Let's let's adjust that a little bit. Adjust your track. Get All the right, so we're gonna shot. Yeah, we're going to do a shaker for this one. Keep it closed, Becca just said, and I agree with her. We're going to start with two <laughs> ounces of pineapple juice, as the kids call it. Uh, I hear the pulling in the background. Sorry. I skipped oh, it. No. That's one of my favorite sounds. Okay, two ounces of pineapple juice. And then we're going to do two ounces of cranberry juice, a healthy drink, until you put the alcohol in it. Isn't every drink? Yeah. We're going to do two ounces of cranberry juice. And now we're going to make it unhealthy. We're going to do a ounce of triple sec. Ooh. Alcohol is that healthy? Yeah, I mean, I mean, maybe if you have a cold, this is good for you. Oh, well, there you go. And we're going to do an ounce of tequila. Tequila for an Italian movie. Who would have thunk it? And here we go. Uh, that's a little closer to two ounces. But there you go. Well, there were a ton of Italian westerns, so you, you could go that route. All shot in, shot in Spain. I just watched God's Gun, an Italian western that was made by uh, the Canon guys before Canon was Canon. Uh, shot in Israel, and uh, it's got Sybil Danning and uh, uh, Lee Van Cleef in it, and he plays a priest uh, who uh, is a gunslinger. And he has a twin brother. It's real good. Any she, movie with Sybil Danning can't be all that bad. She's in a bunch of early canon movies. Like uh, They kind of realize, they're like, oh, people want to see her in movies. Go figure. All right, we're going to shake this, and we're going to hold it super tight. Like, really tight. 
Don't let go. <laughs> don't let go. Don't let go. Don't let go. Let me in, Carol Ann. Let me in for your drink. All right. Pour this in a cup. <laughs> no, drink it right out of the shaker. Drink it right out. Look at that beautiful pink color. Very festive. Ooh. Perfect for a honeymoon. Perfect for the honeymoon. These are the colors for your wedding. Chiffon. All right. Uh, cheers. To, cheers to Mario Baba Pazuzu. Cheers to all of you for hanging out with us. We got 25 people in chat. That's pretty good. It's it looks like everybody the liked the video. The Blu-ray disc next to me. What's that? I said it's oddly the same color as the Blu-ray disc Ooh. next to me. I'm very happy with how that came out. I drank the rest of my melon ball. So, a, and remember, if you guys go to the drive-in, I'm not pushing drinks on you, but I will be making drinks at the drive-in. You can remember that goddamn that strong. Yeah, they are. We That's would never fun. recommend bringing in your own uh, concessions to the drive-in, but they don't sell booze there, so I guess that's oh, okay. And I worried for the first year, I was like, can I bring beer? And then I saw someone had their own bar with like blenders on it, and I was like, you can really do whatever you want. All right. So anything else you we want to say about... Yeah, our first-class passengers can do whatever they want. I always think of that guy in the blob that had a bar in his trunk. Oh, yeah, I love that dude. That Scott Jeske back just yelled. I mean it we didn't just, end out it didn't end up very well for him, but getting there was sure fun. We just watched uh Lombada, the canon movie, and he's in that movie. Does he I have a bar? I forced back in into Lombada today and she didn't like it. She didn't understand that it's a forbidden dance. It's not for, but you're going to learn. She's like, will you do, will you dance on a motorcycle like this? And I was like, a little too fat for that. Baby. Did you come to countdown to the movie? Yes, you did. Oh, Vivi says it's time to get to the second film. Yeah. Is she going to jump up on the couch? Like uh, one of the dogs on Cisco and Ebert now. <laughs> we will not have a dog of the week on this show. Everybody she can do Anywho. that when I talk about Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Or I spit on your grave. Oh uh, well, yeah. If the you new go, one, yeah, the old one. you can watch a hatchet for the honeymoon in HD on YouTube. Oh, so okay. why not? You know, there's a link on the Groovy Doom page. Uh, go get it from there. We will be back after the movie to talk more about it for the notorious third segment of the Drive in Asylum double feature. Go watch, man. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.